You know, envy is one of the seven deadly sins. And, um, you know, it may be the one that I'm the most susceptible to. Well, because gluttony and sloth. Anyway, um, so, you know, I am particularly envious of people who I really admire creatively. And, you know, Felix Scheinberger is one of those people. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I'm, I'm jealous of this guy, and I'm not saying that in a kind of fawning fanboy kind of way, but um, this, he's able to do something that I feel like I should be able to do. I mean, he's, his drawings, they seem like I could do them. And yet, I can't really. Um, and part of it is because he's, he's so um, effortless and confident in his line. Um, there's always like a lot of wit in his work too. I mean, he's German and we've been listening to him speak in German all week. So that isn't necessarily what you think of as a source of, of wit. But wit in this, I don't know, maybe Mozart. Well, Mozart was Austrian. But anyway, he, there's, there's always like kind of a f funny casualness to his stuff. And, and also the way that he uses color is so great. I mean, it's so, um, rest not restrained, but it's like he puts in just the right amount of color. Like he doesn't do big paintings. He just puts in color in a cool way. And it's everything about what he does is sort of wonky, like as, as I would like to be, but, um, but also loose and free. Anyway, you know, um, I, I first saw Felix's work online a long time ago. And then in my, you know, it's like, it's like when you see something that you want to have, you know, you try and figure out how to have it. And so I sort of s seduced him into joining um, the people who were in this book I did called An Illustrated Journey. And my goal with him was really to to interview him and to try to figure out like, what are his secrets? What's he really doing to do these things? And, and I sort of learned a bit, you know, and I've also, honestly, he's a guy who I've actually sat and copied. Like I've copied his drawings. I've copied his lettering because I am, you know, so, um, you know, uh, what's the term? Acquisitive? No. Um, I'll think of it in a minute, but I'm, I want it. Um, so, you know, then this book, Urban Watercolor Sketching, maybe you've got it. It's amazing book, dreadful title, misleading, stupid American publisher changed the title, but, you know, you probably know about this book. Um, particularly if we're in week five of exploring, you, you know about Felix and how amazing he is. Um, there's also this book, it's called something in German. Um, this book is another amazing one of his books all kinds of stuff in it and it's not just about work hard it's all about different kinds of ways to use a sketchbook and he sent me an email yesterday saying that it's um it's coming out in english and i think in fact you can pre-order it on amazon i'm sure we can tell you more about that but but then my next step was to figure out okay when to get him into sketchbook school and so we could film what he does and actually see him doing it um, and so I've studied these videos, particularly the ones in the last, this week's videos, I've watched them several times. There's so many different aspects to, to these videos and the things that he talks about. It's, I don't think he can necessarily come out and point blank say, this is how I do it. I mean, A, why would he? But B, I don't know that it's that easy to do. So, so I'm always interested in learning the different things about what he does. And, and I think one of the things that he talks about that I really liked was um, kind of limiting your your colors and your and your tools. You know, I love those little kind of mini um, pencils that he has that are sharpened at both ends. He just stuffs in his pocket. Um, so I decided I was going to work with just these three guys. These are sort of the process colors, as it happens to red, yellow, and blue. You can kind of make infinite combinations out of them, but I'm not going to be mixing. That's not my goal. I want to keep colors pure the way that Felix does. So the, the exercise that I want to focus on for 
study hall was the one that has the two critters, right? That were the critter, the plastic critter that you go and position in different places. And I wanted it to be two. I wanted to take that exercise that he does in terms of um, almost the sort of cinematic ways of representing extreme um, wide shots going all the way down to an extreme close-up. And, um, you know, here's what I think is really interesting about this, and I don't know that necessarily Felix said it in the class, but I think what's interesting about this exercise is it shows you the incredible power that composition has emotionally, right? That it can it can really convey so much depending on how far you are or where in the page the focus is, the, the character that you're showing. You know, how different it is when something is close up versus very small and far away, you know, and where it is in the frame and how that changes the, the feelings about it and the relationships between more than one. So I decided I wanted to have two cr critters to play with and I didn't have anything that I really liked in my house. So I went out and I bought this guy and this guy. Um, they're sort of three-dimensional stick figures and they're poseable, sort of. So I decided that I would, oh, and, I, and then I also bought um, this. Do you remember Silly Putty? Remember when we were kids? Silly Putty. It's this kind of, it's, it's not quite like plasticine or clay, modeling clay. It has this kind of weird plasticky, rubbery feeling to it. And you can also pick up uh, newsprint with it. But I decided I liked it. And as it happened, it's like the exact same color as this guy. So, so I decided I would use this to just kind of make something that I could put on one of these characters to distinguish it from the others. And for some reason, maybe it was this talk of, of the great train robbery, or maybe it was just talking about framing that made me start thinking um, in terms of Westerns. I mean, I think that there's so many great um, uses of composition in Western movies, movies of John Ford, Sergio Leone, who's, who's uh, you know, the great Italian spaghetti western director um, but just that idea of like composing your frame we have like a guy you know in one corner and a little tiny figure in the background so so i i set up these guys and i started to kind of pose them in different kind of relationships to each other to sort of make a point about that and um and i also took this this silly putty and i spent a lot of time trying to make a cowboy hat but i discovered a few things about silly putty one is that it's not that easy to work with. And another thing is that Silly Putty, even if you manage to make a cowboy hat kind of shaped thing out of it, over time it will start to droop. And so you can make kind of, um, you can make a, a visor and a, a brim out of it, which I did, you know, but then um, it will start to collapse. So anyway, I spent a lot of time, ridiculously stupid amount of time trying to make this hat to put on this guy. Uh, and then I spent time sort of setting them up with like little props so that I could have a sense of perspective. And then I did some drawings. Um, so these are some drawings that I did. And, you know, the, basically my idea was I'm going to try them in different relationships to each other. I'm going to try them where the guy is alone, one guy is alone, and one guy is in the foreground in another shot, and then they're both kind of equally balanced, and then one's like super close up, and you know, one's looking up at him. What does it look like if I'm looking up at him? What does it look like if they're both the same size and shape? I tried different things. I tried limiting the colors that I used. It was okay. It was okay. I think that these little characters that I bought, it was kind of a mistake because they're too simple. They're not really interesting to draw. Um, so then I started thinking, why am I trying to create a Western? Why don't I just look at a Western? And so I did. I went and I got, on YouTube, I got a, um, I started watching The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, which is, you know, a classic movie with uh, Clint Eastwood and Lee Van Cleef and Eli Wallach. Strangely enough, this is very odd, but Eli Wallach was my grandfather's cousin. And he plays this kind of smarmy Mexican critter in um, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. He's, 
the ugly. And he's my relative. Nice, right? Anyway, so uh, there's a final scene in The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, which is the sort of quintessential Mexican standoff. And I decided that I would try and basically do the storyboard of that because it's a great piece of depiction of, um, of perspectives. You have these really super wide shots that show like these three guys they are basically in a cemetery and they're just standing there and the, and the camera just keeps cutting from one to the other to the other and sometimes it gets closer and sometimes it cuts in on their gun and they just stand there and it, the, the tension keeps building and building and building until finally there's like this, the shoe down. So that's what I did. I spent uh, some time just watching the scene and drawing the compositions of each frame of each different camera setup and then just for fun I put it all together. So um, I'm not quite sure that it's what Felix meant, but you know, as usual, I didn't really listen to the teacher. And even though I want to learn from him, I do. I do. I want to be Felix Scheinberger, but maybe with more hair. Anyway, so here's the good, the bad, and the ugly. Good drawings, bad drawings, ugly drawings. Indulge me. See you in class.